Good morning. It's Wednesday. Welcome to First Light. We're studying the Old Testament book of Zechariah during the restoration period of Israel's history. So we're toward the end of the Old Testament. We're in Zechariah chapter 1, and we are encountering a series of prophetic utterances by the prophet Zechariah. And so we are in chapter 1. We're in verse 7 today for the second uh, prophecy. Verse 7, on the 24th day of the 11th month, the month of Shabbat, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, son of Berechiah, son of Edu. During the night, I had a vision, and there before me was a man riding a red horse. He was standing among the myrtle trees in a ravine. Behind him were red, brown, and white horses. And I asked, what are these, my Lord? And the angel who was talking with me answered, I will show you what they are. Then the man standing among the myrtle trees explained. Now let's just pause here for just a second. The first thing I want you to notice is, is that this is, this is different from all the prophetic utterances that we have looked at before. Before, we, we saw a prophet who was speaking the words of God, a prophetic utterance as God speaking through the prophet to deliver some word of the Lord, some message. This one's a bit different because this one is a vision. And I'm telling you that the idea of, of uh, taking a vision seriously is sometimes not done very well by Bible scholars and people who study the Bible because visions are distorted reality. They're not normal reality, oftentimes. And so in visions, things often are out of whack. They're, there's something unrealistic about them. The closest thing I can give you an example is, think about maybe a dream that you've had. You've had a dream and you are in a forest looking at a frog and you're dreaming about that. And, and when you wake up, you remember all this. You were in a forest, but then suddenly you're in your living room. And in the dream, you have no idea how you went from the forest to the living room. And that's the point, is that reality is twisted and bent. It's not normal. And that's the way visions often are. Especially, for example, you take the book of Revelation, um, Bible scholars don't often, and people who teach the Bible, don't often take seriously that the whole book of Revelation is a vision of Jesus Christ. Reality is twisted, and, and it should be understood from that perspective. And let me give you an example right here. This is a small example, but it is right here in the passage we're studying. So verse 8 during the night, I had a vision, and there before me, okay, so he's going to see something. What does he see? He sees a man, he's a man, riding a red horse. Now, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but when I read in my uh, notes and, and study materials, I find that there's apparently a Hebrew word for riding um, a horse that is actually moving, and then being on a horse when it's not moving. And this happens to be, I'm told, uh, the, the verb of a horse that's not moving. So this is not a galloping horse. That's why some translations say a man seated on a horse. So we've got a man, he's seated on a horse, a red horse. And then it says in the very next sentence, he was standing among the myrtle trees. Well, wait a second, is, is he on a horse? Or is he standing? Which is it? And you may say, well, Ronnie, you're making a big deal. No, this is the nature of a vision. Things shift. And then there is apparently an angel who's like a tour guide. That often happens in visionary experiences. The angel, so, so the person who's the prophet speaks to an angel. The angel speaks to them. And then they speak to this other person. And so... Um, in verse 10, the man standing among the myrtle trees explained, they are the ones the Lord has sent out. Well, who are they? The only they around here are horses, because there's only one man who's mentioned. Well, are they horses? Or are they people? What are they? 
Well, I don't know what they are. They appear to be horses, but horses gallop and they travel. And so this is symbolic language. These horses go out and they report back. And then notice verse 11. And they, that is the horses that went out, they reported to the angel of the Lord. Well, wait a minute. I thought this was a man. Is this a man or an angel? Well, who is it? Well, it's the angel of the Lord, but apparently this angel of the Lord has the appearance of a man. And that's actually not a rare thing that you find in the Bible. The angel of the Lord could be an angel, a true angel. and But remember, an angel, the word angel means messenger. So this could be an angelic being, or it could be something else. Or many times uh, in the Bible, the angel of the Lord ultimately is God. We find that um, when the angel of the Lord comes to meet with Abraham in the book of Genesis, there's uh, three people and they are uh, they appear to be angels, messengers of God, and then suddenly God's talking. Well, wait, is it an angel? Is it God? Well, the angel of the Lord sometimes is God. Um, so here, just notice the shift. We have a man, but now the man is the angel of the Lord. And now what is the report of the horses? The report of the horses in verse 11 is, we have gone throughout the earth, the whole earth, and found the whole world at rest and at peace, and in peace. Now, friends, I just want to tell you, that is a rare thing. The world is constantly in turmoil. In fact, when the Apostle Paul writes in Galatians that at just the right time, Jesus was born, um, there's some powerful, significant words at just the right time because Jesus was born in a time of peace. I know the Romans had occupied Israel, but Israel and Rome weren't at war because Rome won. Um, the world was fairly at peace. It was one of the very rare moments in all of world history when the nations were not turning, churning and at war. Even today, right now, in 2020, as I'm speaking, there are multiple, multiple wars going on right now. Some have been going on for decades. We just don't hear about them that much because our news media doesn't report constantly on these wars that are ongoing. So the world... Is it rest? Well, why would this be a significant thing to these people right now? Remember who they are. They are Jews who were conquered and they were hauled off into captivity. And now they're finally being, they've been brought back to their land. In verse 12, the angel of the Lord said, Lord Almighty, how long Will you withhold mercy from Jerusalem and from the towns of Judah, which you have been angry with these 70 years? So this angel of the Lord is speaking to the Lord Almighty as a separate entity. We still don't know exactly who the angel of the Lord is, but this person is speaking to God Almighty. And ask the question, how long are you going to be angry with the towns of Judah, the people of God? I mean, it's been 70 years. And so verse 13, fulfilling the promise of Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 29, where God spoke through good word of promise to Jeremiah. So the Lord spoke kind and comforting words to the angel who talked with me. So God has kept his promise to bring his people back his wrath and his judgment that had come upon the Jewish people is now over. This is a time of healing and restoration. Doesn't mean that everything is exactly the way it ought to be with God's people. There's, there's, they still got some growth to do. But the time of harsh judgment is over. Then verse 14, the angel who was speaking to me said, Proclaim this word. This is what the Lord Almighty says. So now notice, see, this is the way visions work. Now, this angel who's the tour guide, who's, who's walking with the prophet, now the angel speaks prophetically a word of God. 
a word from the Lord. So the angel who was speaking to me said, proclaim this word. He's giving a message, meaning on behalf of God, to the prophet. Proclaim this word. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I am very jealous for Jerusalem and Zion. Now, to us, the word jealousy is always a bad word. I mean, I, honest, at least in any time I've ever heard it used, it's a very, in our language in English today, at least around the circles where I am in the books I read, jealousy is a is a possessive, insecure, negative emotion of clinginess to something that you're fearful about. So uh, the classic case is uh, a guy does not want his girlfriend talking to anybody, nobody. He's jealous. He can't handle even a casual conversation. That's jealousy. It's based in insecurity. It often has anger associated with it. It's an immature, negative emotion. But that's not necessarily the root, especially from a biblical perspective, of what this word means. Maybe in, 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 a, in a better way, it has a sense of jealousy. Jealousy, the one thing that it does have in its favor is the idea of being connected relationally to somebody. Okay, so you're not going to be jealous of a stranger. You're jealous of for on behalf of your wife or your children or or your church, you're, something you're emotionally connected to. So that's part of the root of this. And then secondly, jealousy is a passionate connection. As, that's why in some Bible translations, it translates it the, the word zealous. In our modern English language, that might capture it a little bit better. It's I'm passionately connected in a positive defensive way and that's the idea here the defensive part i am very jealous for jerusalem and zion zion is a metaphorical symbolic word that refers to god's people so for the city of jerusalem and god's people zion but i'm angry with the nations that feel secure so notice that God is protective of his people. These people belong to him. Remember, God loves everybody, but God didn't pick everybody. God picked one nation out of the entire family of the human race, and he chose to reveal himself to that group of people. That group of people, uh, he would be their God and he would be God of those people and they were to reveal him to the rest of the peoples of the earth, which they tended to not do. But that was God's plan to reveal himself. He chose and revealed himself to one people and God is possessive. He loves uh, the Jewish people. He has selected them. Even though he's punished them, he's zealous for them. He cares about them. He's jealous for them. I'm angry with the nations that feel secure. I was only a little angry, but they added to the calamity. So the nations, in their arrogance, are stirring up themselves the wrath of God. Therefore, verse 16, this is what the Lord says. I will return to Jerusalem with mercy, and there my house will be rebuilt and the measuring line will be stretched out over Jerusalem declares the Lord Almighty now this stretched out obviously it could mean uh, like in the sky you measure the entire city and we're gonna see um, in another vision that the city is measured somehow some way but what if it's meant in a more um, metaphoric um, symbolic way uh, in a generalized way, that the measuring line is going to be actively pursued. It's a, it's a picture of building. Why is all of this prophecy comforting and strengthen, strengthening to these people? Because they're in a war zone. They're rebuilding a temple that has been demolished. They've rebuilt some of their houses. They finally got a place to live in their house. God's house is only just partially reconstructed. There's rubble and destruction everywhere. It's a war zone. 
And so if a measuring line is going to be out in Jerusalem again, it implies rebuilding, not just of not just of the temple, but of people's homes and businesses. And it's a sign of growth, a sign of prosperity. In fact, that's picked up in the next verse where it says in verse 17, proclaim further. This is what the Lord Almighty says. My towns will again overflow with prosperity. See, in a war zone, the economy collapses and it has to be grown and rebuilt again. And so that's the kind of prosperity it's going to be. It's not that everybody's going to be rich. It's that it's not going to be a war zone anymore. They're going to move past the brokenness of what happened, and they're going to be a thriving city and nation again. And the Lord will again comfort Zion and choose Jerusalem. Well, wait a minute. I thought he already chose Jerusalem. He's going to choose them again. Well, See, notice that the word choosing is a relational term. It's not so much a decision-related term, although a decision is involved, because if that were the case, God decided he chose Israel all the way back at Abraham. They've always been chosen, right? But here, to be chosen is to enter into an intimate, close fellowship relationship. And I think that idea that we just see here in Zechariah is carried over into the New Testament when the New Testament tells us that we are chosen. The Apostle Paul says we are chosen in Christ. It's not so much a decision part of that. It's a relational aspect of the decision. It's the relate. It's the connecting, um, emotionally connecting. So what's the best part of all this? Well, first of all, it's I, God, will return to Jerusalem. Well, it's not that God has ever left them, but that his activity and his presence have been muted. He didn't listen to their prayers for a while because when they were in a state of rebellion, now he's returning. His activity among them is increasing and growing. The prophets are speaking. And my house will be rebuilt. Friends, that's a powerful promise when you think about it had been in ruins and they had laid the foundation and started the process, but then they were commanded by a king, the emperor, to stop. They were commanded to stop. And they've only just, in the last couple of months, started the rebuilding process. They're just getting going again. It's it's still really early. They got a ways to go. Yeah, they've got they've got a ways to go. And so the power of this promise is that in the midst of all the destruction around you, in the midst of you're really just getting going on this project, this huge monumental project, it's going to be completed. The house of God will be rebuilt. And friends, that's the power of hope. That's the power of having a vision of the end result. That's the power of knowing that I'm not on an uncertain course that has complete um, guesswork involved, but I'm on God's team. He's got a plan. He's got a purpose. He's with us, and we're moving in his direction. I may not know everything that's going to happen, but I do know this. God's with us. He's not going to forsake us. He's leading us. He's guiding us. This temple will be rebuilt. And of course, this is only a repetition of the same exact prophecy that Haggai gave when when he said that the glory of this present temple will be greater than the glory of Solomon's temple and that God will visit us. Notice now it's two prophetic books, prophets preaching at the same time that specifically say, I am coming powerful words of hope to a broken people who are being restored. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, I thank you so much for the nature of your love and your mercy that you extend to us. And Lord, there are moments in our lives when we encounter mountains, we encounter obstacles, we encounter tremendous difficulties, and we just... We just don't see how this is going to turn out. 
and words of comfort and assurance from you that you know us and you have a plan stabilize us. They ground us in the word. They they ground our emotions which can start to bounce off the charts and and you help us to stay focused on you. I'm thankful, Lord. I'm thankful that there are times when you speak stern words to us because there are times when we need discipline. But Lord, I'm also thankful for those times when you speak tenderly to people, as you did in this passage. And Lord, I believe right now, right now, under the sound of my voice, there's somebody out there who just needs to know that you speak tenderly and lovingly to those whom you are restoring. Yes, you give a rebuke, but you also speak words of precious, loving support and comfort. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. We are unworthy of all of your goodness and graciousness. For we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen and amen. Have a great day and walk as the redeemed people of God today. This is First Light.